today's final spotlight is Engaging for Refugees in Europe, Middle East, and Africa, the SAP Experience. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to welcome Miguel Castro, who will be presenting this for us. Thank you so much. So thanks everyone for being here. I know that it's the last session before we go for lunch. So yes, 20 minutes to go. And I wanted to present to you the topic about how is it that we in SAP cooperate around the refugee inclusion in different geographies in the world. For uh, just a brief intro about the company, SAP, we are the largest software management company, business management software company in the world. We have more than 96,000 employees in more than 70 countries. And our customers are right now for more than 400,000 companies. And we have more than 17,000 partners all over the world that help implement our solutions. Our purpose as an organization is to help the world run better and improve people's lives. This is something we take very strongly. And also for our CEO, he says he wants SAP to be the most open-minded and inclusive software company on the planet. So what I'm going to be telling you about in the next minutes is going to be about like how is it that we focus on the refugee topic from a diversity and inclusion standpoint and from a corporate social responsibility standpoint, okay? Because this is the type of area in which you can match the two of them. Um, our focus when it comes to um, diversity and inclusion is what we're discussing in here in the conference is very similar to other companies, is making sure that everybody has got equal access to opportunities and the same chances to develop within the organization, okay? And to develop inclusive leaders and also to help with the usage of our technology it create a more inclusive work environment in those of our customers. When it comes to our corporate social responsibility pillars, we would have three main areas that we focus on. Building digital skills, uh, helping accelerate best run in non-profit, no, um, NGOs and social enterprises, and then making sure that we connect motivated employees with a meaningful work in the communities. Those are the three main areas that we have for that one. If we start looking into the refugee topic specifically, when we look at migration, I, uh, the McKinsey report that talks about global migration says that, and I'm very bad with numbers, so I need to check those ones, we, need, uh, we have to more than 240 million migrants in the world. When we're talking about the migrant community, the refugee community, those that were displaced against their will because they needed to flee their countries because of fear, war conflicts, etc., those could be the 10% of the migrant population. If we look at the economic contribution of the migrant community overall, they have the impact of 7.6 trillion US dollars to the economy, which is 3 trillion US dollars more than what they would have contributed if they stayed in the country. However, if we would close the migrant wage gap, that also exists, same thing as when we talk about gender pay gap and so on, we would have one additional trillion US dollars that would be contributed to the economy. When, while we're talking about this in the refugee crisis and how it was for Europe, Middle East and Africa, it's because when it came to 2015, there was, uh, 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 I don't know if this is working. So anyway, so it started in here in the Middle Eastern area when it came to Syria. There was the majority of the people that were displaced, but it was also coming from Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan, and the migration started coming to Central Europe here through Turkey, and coming in the majority of the cases through Greece and then all over to Central and Northern Europe. The number of people that were displaced at the time, in 2015 only, those that came to Europe were 1.2 million asylum seekers. That was twice the amount that we were having in the years before. This continued until 2016, and then is when the European Union governments reached an agreement with Turkey in order to provide the financial support for Turkey to assimilate the majority of the migrants. Even, even before that point, the number of migrants that moved, the number of refugees, were for Turkey, there were close to 2 million refugees. When it comes to Lebanon, there were 1.1, so slightly less than the whole of European Union, and Lebanon being a much smaller country, and the, when it comes to the economy, not a comparable situation. And when it came to Jordan, there was 600,000 refugees as well. So when the media got a lot talking about the refugee crisis in Europe, if we're looking about the Middle East and neighbor countries, it was even bigger in those places too. You know, so when it comes to addressing the topic, what we did with NSAP, we said like, okay, let's look at it depending on how we are, uh, how the refugee situation is in these three parts in the world. Meaning, what are the, or the destination countries, focusing on Germany, which is where the company is headquartered. How is the situation in the transit countries, for example, Greece. 
and how is the situation in the neighboring countries of the origin, you know, of the origin of the conflicts. And that's going to, they're going to take you through three programs. The first one that I'm going to tell you about is the one in Germany, which is the one that we call Engaging for Refugees. In here, the main focus that we had was about saying, okay, when we are talking about refugees, it's not that we are talking to people without professional experience, without education. Many of them had professional jobs within their countries, and they relocated to other parts of the world, basically against their will, but that doesn't mean that they shouldn't have access to employment because they actually had a professional experience. So what we did in cooperation with many other companies to, in an initiative called We Are Together, it's we focused on what type of positions can we create in our companies in which we can hire from the refugee community as fast as possible. It was a very beautiful project as well in cooperation with the um, German authorities, with the public sector, because you need to speed up the process in order to be able to hire refugees as well. There's the legal, comp uh, the legal implication of like about hiring refugees, but the German government was very much pro cooperating with the private sector in order to make this happen. So in the case of SAP, we uh, published 150, we hired 150 p people to join us through this program for positions related to software development, software testing, product management, and then areas like marketing, HR, and so on. We opened all these um, um, positions specifically for refugees. There were six months positions, they were time limited. Out of those six months, we managed to be able to retain 30% uh, of those. So one third of those. So it was, we could retain 50 more employees that were coming from the refugee community. So that was our way to help employment. Another component was that, that, that was focusing on the people that had already professional experience and skills and that had already been working in companies. What happens also for many refugees is when they need to interrupt their studies, where they're studying in high school at the university. For that particular one, we have an university close to the part of Germany where we're headquartered in a place called Mannheim, where we sponsor dual studies for business informatics. Out of that one, we decided to launch for every year 10 positions for people who are coming as refugees, 10 additional ones, to start participating in the company within the training program. The initial, uh, the initial um, batch was in English because you couldn't expect from them to speak German. But then two years later, those that had come as younger refugees were already more fluent in German, so we started doing the German program for them so that they could assimilate and integrate in society better. The, in order to integrate or to help include the refugee community within the company, something that I normally highlight as a best practice that we got was the engagement with the cultures at SAP Employee Resource Group. We have several employee resource groups within the company. What we said was in order to facilitate the assimilation is we have the subgroups as Arabs at SAP, Latinos at SAP, Africans at SAP, and so on as part of the cultures at SAP network in Germany. So we said we need your help in order to help these new colleagues assimilate to our corporate culture much better because as opposed to you who are experts coming from different parts of the world, these people who are originally from your countries as well didn't voluntarily come in here. But your help in order for them to understand our company culture and the German working culture is going to be critical and that's something that really helped us in this way. Okay. There were also very beautiful initiatives in, in Germany when it came to taking a position in favor of the inclusion of the refugee community. Because I don't know if you heard about this in the US, but when it came to Central Europe, the political polarization happened to many parties to start addressing the topic of being against the refugee inclusion and against the acceptance of refugees. So the corporate world in Germany, with SAP being in one of the leading, in the, one of the leading roles, was to help launch campaigns with the diversity and inclusion organizations in Germany in favor of the refugee community with initiatives like We Are More, a flag for diversity, etc., to position yourself as regardless of what discussion is going on in the public. We as the largest employers in the country, we believe that this is something that we should be in favor of because diversity makes us a better society. Actually, the sense of pride for the colleagues that we had launched this type of programs and managed to include the refugee community at work was a huge one in terms of showing like we are there to take the necessary steps whenever there's a challenging situation in society and we really make the world run better and improve people's lives. It was start thinking now at the Greece situation. We have a program within SAP, which is SAP Social Sabbatical, okay? This is a program that we've been running since 2012. We send people from all over the world to a particular country to work with different NGOs, and we help them improve, review the process, and tackle business challenges that they're having at that time. It's a set of getting 
let's say, a set of several consultants for, to, work, to work for you pro bono during one month to tackle a particular business program. We normally focus on being, going to countries like in Asian countries, Latin America, Africa, etc. What we happened is we chose a European country as well, in this case Greece, just because of the role that they were having as a transit country. So with that one, some of our colleagues cooperated with NGOs that were changing the focus on the type of work that we were doing for social inclusion with a, a minorities and people from lower socioeconomic backgrounds to say like right now our priority needs to become helping the refugees that are going through the country. And Greece was at that time not in the best economic situation of the European Union. So that was a very interesting component about all the colleagues that went to Greece and started engaging with this type of NGOs there. And then if we look at the origin countries, what happens in there is like we have another program within SAP, which are the SAP Code Weeks. That one focuses on one side, uh, helping children to have access to technology. We teach uh, co um, coding skills, like for example, with a scratch, okay? Which is the typical way that you would also accelerate children, not be afraid of what coding means, and learn this type of technology too. And then for people who are young, but not children anymore, they could have access to employment. What we do in these cases, we teach them more employable skills, so that they could have access to find a job in the IT sector um, in their communities. This is something we've been doing already for many years. We started with this in the Africa Code Week. We had the Latino Code Week. We do it in the US when it comes to working with community colleges with underrepresented minorities. We do it in Southeast Asia, in Australia, New Zealand. So this is the type of programs that we have all over the world, looking for local partner organizations that would help us identify how is it that we reach the relevant communities and what type of skills should we be bringing to these communities. We train the trainer, we normally train the teachers, with all these type of activities, we trained already in 2018 only, 34,000 teachers worldwide. And then we managed to reach 2.8 million youth in 93 different countries. So this is something that is huge. And we said like, okay, let's take all the knowledge and all the learning that we have from here, and let's focus on helping those who are in the refugee camps. So we started with this program, we called it back then Refugee Code Week. Now we changed the name to Digital Skills for Today because we are not doing it only for the refugee community anymore. We are doing it also with disadvantaged population in places like Lebanon, Jordan, Egypt, Turkey, etc. We still have around 40% of the participants being refugees, but it's not only for refugees now. So with that particular one, we helped train already um, 400 graduates that got employment since 2016. When it comes to children, we managed to train 26,000 people to start having access to technology because the situation when you're in a refugee camp is that you have many idle moments. You're in there in a country, especially in the Middle Eastern area, where they do is they have a refugee camp and they provide you what you have in order for you to have your basic needs covered. But the access to education and so on continues being a challenge. So this is the area in which we partner with the UNHCR, with the refugee organization in the UN, and with other training institutions in order to be able to, first of all, start providing further skills for children, and then help with employment access for those who are already prepared in order to access the workforce. It's one of the components that if we look at the job opportunities for technology in the Middle East, only in Saudi Arabia there was a gap for a shortage for 30,000 IT professionals in 2016. So it's in order to help build the skills for those people in order to access the workforce, because the employment through technology is something that is relevant all over the world. So this is how we help close the gap in that area. The type of skills that we would teach in, in Jordan, Turkey, Iraq, etc., there could be for some of those, like I, we have a partner that is called Reboot Camp, and in that one we focus on building engineers. So that one is a several month program. Okay, so you end up being a software engineer. With the other organization that we partner with, which is Recoded, we focus on teaching Android and web development skills for people to be able to start coding and even working remotely, have access to employment by uh, building this type of technology. This is pretty much what I wanted to share with you. I don't know if at this time you have got questions and so on about any of the three programs when it comes to the work that we do in Germany, in the transit countries, and in the neighboring countries of the or the ones with the conflict. Any questions for anyone? Yes? Do you have any metrics in place to mm -hmm. measure the success of these programs? Yes. 
Yes, the key metrics that we're sharing is when it comes to, first of all, the number of people that you skill, when it comes to teachers, then how many people do you end up reaching? And then when you're talking about those who are in an employable age, in an age that they are able to access employment, is how many of those actually find a job? That's normally the whole life cycle that we look at when it comes to the metrics of activities in the, in the Middle Eastern and Northern Africa area, like in Egypt for us, and so on, for example. The ones in Germany for us was more like how many people did we manage to get to get employed, the, to get positions for them to work with us. That's in the material for the session that, I put in, that we put as well. You see a video from one of our colleagues who shares her experience about being originally from Iran. Having worked in HR in her organization, she had been doing things about recruitment in, in Tehran and how she joined the SAP to work in our talent acquisition organization for those colleagues that support the recruitment process remotely. So in that type of position, all you need is English skills because basically we ask people to speak English to work with us and then the relevant local language, depending on where you are. So if you're going to be doing sales in Germany, you need to speak German. If you're going to be doing product development, in that case, you only need to speak English because you don't have a customer facing position. So in our case, English is the key language skill that you need to have. That's why also for the people that we hire within HR and support organizations, it's also the most important one. We had also a very good story with a colleague called Sana. She came uh, from Syria and she was doing software development in there. And the moment she joined our team, we knew at the beginning that uh, uh, engaging with refugees and including them as part of our organizations could be a positive one. We didn't know exactly where we were going to be seeing the positive effect. Something really beautiful that we saw was the people from the Middle East, when it comes to the hobbies, when they're children, many of them don't have the focus on the sport that we have in Western countries. They would have artistic focus. So they would take, take art classes and so on. So the SANA not only had the skills in order to do coding and development and to join the department for big data development, what we saw with her is that she had a very good skill in order to paint the process flows to represent the customer processes and actually be able to do the customer workshops just because her graphic skills were much better than the average German software engineer, to put it like this. Yes. <laughs> yes? that when you engage refugees in Germany, they have work uh, authorization maybe for six months. So what was the six months limit and what happens after the six so months? No, the six months limit was what we had in order to launch the program. In order for us to dedicate the budget to create all these additional positions, we say we're going to be putting all this money to hire people additionally to the workforce planning that we had from the refugee community. So they were time -fristed, it was a time fristed period also because you are not going to be asking anybody to say like, okay, I know that you've been fleeing war, but I would like to see your university degree, your employment references, and everybody that has, you've been working with, who is it that I can call in to check the reference of your employment? So you need to make the process easier, but also for that time, you offer a position which is six months, and then you say like, and then depending on the additional positions that we're going to be able to offer to you and the type of performance that you have within your job, we might be able to retain your not. We saw that being one of the largest employers in the country and the type of skills, the uh, access to employment that it has having work with SAP solutions, we were like, in the cases of those people that we cannot retain within the company, having worked for SAP and having SAP skills, it's something that's going to help you also find the subsequent job opportunities. But the six months was a limit that we put to say like, let's make it easier for us to hire people because the important thing now is to help them find a job, not necessarily to go through a very long recruitment process. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Yes. More questions? Yes? I'm just wondering, was there anything that surprised you in doing this work that you didn't expect would be the case or a factor that, that you didn't think was going to happen? So the positive feeling that I created within the workforce. We didn't know how it would be seen. We know we, it, when it comes to the people survey that we have in the company, diversity inclusion is one of the most valued components that everything that we do from as an organization in the area of HR. We didn't know how the sense of pride would grow because even the people like being an employee in which you have so many people is the same thing as in the US and everywhere in the world. Your employees would have different political ideas. To me, the interesting thing was for those that were like with question marks about the government approach when it came to uh, access of refugees, 
to say like, but even in a situation that I'm not sure how I feel about, I really like that my company managed to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. So that type of feeling to me was very reassuring. And then the, what I was mentioning, for example, the skills of someone from SANA. You know, it's like we knew that the um, impact on diversity and inclusion, it's a, it's a big one within the company. But normally when you get a position, you're coming from other parts of the world because in our headquarters, we have around 100 nationalities working together. You know, so we are used to having people from different nationalities and different backgrounds. But in this case, we were like, those are more like the typical expats. It's more, you end up applying for a position, you go for that country for that position, you have the formal visa processing in order to get there. The company is normally sponsoring you. So the type of profiles that you have in there are a very specific section of a country's population. We didn't know how those are the type of professionals would be the moment that they are not voluntary experts but they are forced to leave the country but the type of experiences that we got were very good ones you also need to prioritize when it comes to something that you realize in this situation is that the type of life experiences that they went through and that they still have are different when it comes to employment so I remember one colleague said like one day we didn't know what our trainee was that one of the person who had joined the program and he didn't hadn't said that he wouldn't come to work that day and the following day, he came to the office and said, I'm sorry that I didn't call in yesterday, but I was one of the few people in the camp that could speak a little bit of German and English. And one of the people that I'm very close to tried to commit suicide, so I needed to spend the whole day in the hospital. You know, so that's a situation that wouldn't luckily happen to most of us in our day-to-day -day situation. But if you are living in a refugee camp, you are dealing with life experiences that have nothing to do with the rest of the society. So that's something that you also need to adjust to the point of uh, you are going to be dealing with colleagues who cannot have the same level of commitment on a daily basis because they might have personal emergencies that go beyond what we would normally expect. Okay. Yes, cool. Thank you, everyone. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Miguel. Mm -hmm.